in the last lecture, we unraveled the atomic mechanisms of the Bainite transformation in steels. And we did it in sufficient depth to enable us now to apply it to the design of some exceptional steels. Now, just to remind you, this is the construction that uh, leads us to the concept of the T0 curve. And if this is the free energy curve of ferrite at this temperature T1 and of austenite at the same temperature versus the carbon concentration, then the equilibrium compositions are given by constructing a common tangent to those curves. And the locus of uh, all these points as a function of temperature gives us the equilibrium phase boundaries, the AE1 and AE3, which contain the alpha plus gamma phase field. On this side, we have alpha and on this side, gamma. There is a point here where um, austenite and ferrite of the same chemical composition have identical free energies and the locus of those points gives me the T0 curve. Now, if I have austenite, uh, the composition of which lies to the right of the T0 curve, then when it transforms without a composition change into ferrite, we will get an increase in free energy and a spontaneous reaction cannot, cannot occur in those circumstances. When the carbon concentration is in this region, uh, less than T0, then I can get a transformation without a composition change and a reduction in free energy. Okay? So that uh, is the meaning of the T0 curve, that it is impossible to get diffusion-less transformation if the composition of the austenite falls to the right of that T0 curve. And we proved that by looking, uh, we proved that uh, bainite initially grows as a diffusionless plate, just like martensite, by comparing the point where the reaction stops with the T0 dashed and the A3 dashed curves, which includes strain energies. Uh, X bar is just the average uh, carbon concentration of a steel. So if you form a plate of bainite, which is uh, supersaturated with carbon, then shortly afterwards, the carbon will partition into the austenite. So the next plate of bainite has to form, form from carbon enriched austenite and so on uh, until the composition reaches the T0 curve. And notice also that uh, when I transform at a higher temperature, I will get less bainite than when I transform at a lower temperature because the amount of carbon the austenite can tolerate uh, increases as you reduce the temperature. And uh, of course the experimental data agree with this construction and therefore we conclude that the transformation occurs without any diffusion in the first instance, followed by the partitioning of carbon into the residual austenite because carbon uh, does not want to stay in the product lattice. Um, it was forced into that lattice by the mechanism of transformation, it was trapped effectively. And at high temperatures, that partitioning process is very rapid. So you're left with a plate which is free from carbon or from carbides. But eventually the region uh, of austenite which is enriched in carbon will transform into <coughs> uh, cementite and some more benetic ferrite. Uh, and at high temperatures, uh, the excess carbon is all, almost all precipitated as cementite. So the particles tend to be very coarse. Um, when the transformation temperature is reduced, uh, the competition between the partitioning of carbon and the precipitation of carbides within the plate is, is more reasonable. And there is an opportunity for some carbides to form inside the ferret plate and therefore less carbon to partition into the remaining austenite. So that means that we end up with a fine distribution of carbide inside the bainite plates and finer uh, cementite particles in between the ferrite plates. So this structure I pointed out to you can be 
stronger and tougher than this structure because these carbides uh, between the platelets are coarse and therefore tend to initiate fracture in one way or another. And then this shows uh, the uh, scale of the carbides here. This is a 0 0.2 micrometer scale and these are the platelets of bainite and you can see that in between the plates we have very coarse carbides which are not good at all for toughness. And uh, you know if you measure the Sharpie impact toughness as a function of uh, the test temperature in a structure without those cementite particle and with those cementite particle this clearly has bad toughness because the impact transition temperature is well above room temperature. This so we need to do something about these uh, cementite precipitates which are coarse. Now, to deal with this problem, we need to eliminate the cementite particles. And it's been known for a long time that the addition of silicon retards the precipitation of cementite. So for example, when we want to make uh, gray cast iron, we ensure that it contains a large amount of silicon. So a lot of the cementite is avoided and graphite precipitates instead. Uh, whereas for white cast iron, you have a smaller silicon concentration. Now, our purpose is to stop the cementite precipitation at this stage of the reaction, because if we do that, then we end up with a mixture of bainitic ferrite plates and carbon enriched retained austenite, which uh, might be a good microstructure for mechanical property optimization. Trouble is that silicon has such a low solubility in cementite that there are no thermodynamic data obtained experimentally for its presence in cementite. So what we can do is we can do first principles calculations. So this is a unit cell of cementite containing four carbon atoms and 12 iron atoms. And if we substitute an iron atom by a silicon atom, then we will get a change in the calculated energy of this structure. And that's, uh, that's what we've done here. This is the pure iron carbon cementite. And this is when we substitute silicon onto an iron atom on a mirror site. And this is the case where we substitute silicon on an iron atom in a general site. And you can see that both of those scenarios lead to a dramatic increase in the energy of the cementite. But the point is we can use these numbers uh, to plug into our thermodynamic models for phase diagram calculations in order to determine uh, approximately how much silicon we need to sufficiently retard cementite precipitation from austenite. Okay. So uh, to cut a long story short, about one to two weight percent of silicon is sufficient for most uh, uh, most steels designed on this concept. So we start by looking at whether we can use this steel in, for example, uh, railway lines. And I'll explain why uh, we are focusing on railway lines a, a little bit later. Um, but it's a very simple chemical composition. This is there to suppress the cementite, but we also need some hardenability to avoid the elevated temperature transformations. And when we isothermally transform this to obtain uh, this lovely structure where we have fine bainite platelets, look at the scale over here, uh, with uh, retained austenite films in between. Uh, it's a composite microstructure which ought to have good properties. It doesn't have any cementite. So if I, if I just look at the advanced advantages of that structure. We have a very fine um, scale of the microstructure, uh, which is good for strength and for toughness, uh, because a fine structure will deflect a cleavage crack more frequently than a coarse structure. We have retained austenite, which at stress concentrations would tend to transform into martensite and relieve the stress concentrations. This is the so-called transformation-induced plasticity effect. And of course, austenite uh, 
in general does not have a ductile brittle transition temperature. Even at low temperatures, it will behave in a ductile manner. So that's good for toughness. And the diffusivity of hydrogen in austenite is orders of magnitude smaller than in ferrite. Uh, so it can act as a barrier to the influx of hydrogen into the steel and hydrogen is bad for the steel, especially strong steels, uh, because it embrittles them. We don't have any cementite to initiate cra uh, cleavage cracks or voids during ductile failure. And we have a very small amount of carbon left in the bainitic ferrite. Uh, so it doesn't greatly influence the ductility of the bainitic ferrite itself. So everything points in the right direction that this should be, uh, you know, uh, almost like a panacea of a microstructure. Now, when we made the material and we tested its toughness, it was terrible. You know, the impact transition temperature is well above room temperature, and that would not be acceptable in an engineering application. So something has gone wrong with our understanding of the structure. And the thing that's gone wrong is the T0 curve, because it stops the transformation before much of the coarse regions of austenite are eliminated. So if you have coarse regions of retained austenite in your structure, so these are more than 50 micrometers in size, then they will trip easily, in other words, transform to martensite easily under the influence of a small stress. Uh, and then you've introduced a brick in your structure of the size of 50 micrometers, which contains untempered, brittle martensite. And all of this is caused by the fact that the reaction will not go further because it's limited by the T0 curve. If you could, if you could encourage more bainitic ferrite to form, then these coarse regions would be consumed. So we seem to be stuck here. But let's, let's look at this T0 curve once again. Now, this is the T0 curve. And we will assume that the bainitic ferrite essentially has zero carbon concentration once the carbon has escaped into the austenite. So the carbon concentration of the bainitic ferrite is along this axis. And uh, this is the average carbon concentration of the steel. So by applying the lever rule to the T0 curve, the amount of bainitic ferrite possible is given by this distance divided by this distance. So uh, normally I ask the question to students that took, uh, judging from this equation, what are the three things that you can do in order to increase the volume fraction of bainite and therefore eliminate the coarse regions of retained austenite? And if you look at this equation, uh, we leave this alone because it's close to zero. Uh, the average carbon concentration in the steel can be reduced. Uh, so we might have this uh, 0.4 carbon concentration so that the amount of bainitic ferrite increases. And we don't compromise strength by doing that because we are introducing more bainitic ferrite. Um, alternatively, we could transform at a lower temperature where the T0 concentration is greater. Of course, there's a limit there because we don't want to hit the martensite start temperature. There is a, a further possibility that this T0 curve is determined by the intersection of the free energy curves of ferrite and austenite. So those free energy curves depend also on the substitutional solutes in the material. So we could design the substitutional solute content such that the whole of this curve shifts to greater concentrations of carbon, limiting concentrations of carbon. So here are some uh, modifications of this original alloy, very simple modifications based entirely on that equation, uh, where first we reduce X bar, okay, by a factor of two. And secondly, we keep the carbon concentration the same but substitute the manganese by nickel. 
because we can do the calculations of the T0 curve. You can even download software freely from my website to do such calculations. Uh, so the effect of substituting manganese is to shift the T0 curve to greater concentrations here. Okay? So that will uh, enable more bainitic ferrite to form and eliminate the large chunks of austenite. Uh, the iron carbon curve has even higher concentrations, but it would not uh, survive the heat treatment required simply because it doesn't have hardenability. So we'll end up with producing ferrite and perlite. Okay, so these two alloys were actually made and they gave the beautiful microstructures illustrated here. This is the one with half the carbon and this is the one with the nickel. Uh, so we have mainly films of austenite between the platelets, the very fine platelets of um, bainitic ferrite. And when we measure the properties, they, they are actually quite extraordinary. It's a simple modifications based on the simple T0 concept. We have shifted the impact transition temperature from about 100 degrees centigrade to minus 100 degrees centigrade. So that's a 200 degrees centigrade shift in the impact transition temperature simply by looking at that equation. Okay, so these are tough steels. Now, of course, they are also strong because of the fine structure. So uh, we thought that we could make uh, rail steels out of, out of uh, this material. So these are typical rail steels. That's a large rail and a small rail. And the normal rail steels uh, suffer from toughness. Uh, so they are very, uh, you can make them as hard as you like, but the toughness is not so good. And this is a quote from Boris Pasternak's uh, Dr. Zhivago, where it says, look, uh, um, Antipo, uh, Antipo, who was the engineer, had been pestering the repair shops about the tracks. The steel wasn't sufficiently tensile, the rails failed, the test for strains, and Antipo thought that they would crack in frosty weather. And that's, that's a reflection of the toughness, okay? So, um, why is, why is the ordinary rail steel, which consists of a perlitic microstructure, not very tough? Well, you can, uh, this is uh, the, the beautiful micrograph taken by Bain, Edgar Bain in 1939 of the perlite structure. And we think of it as alternating lamellae of cementite and ferrite. But actually that's a misconception as Hillard showed many years ago. We're looking at two dimensional sections and the reality is that a colony of perlite actually consists of um, a bicrystal of ferrite and cementite. And when we section it, it appears like this. So just to get that concept into your mind, this is a cabbage which represents a single crystal of cementite because all the leaves are connected at the root. Uh, so it's a single crystal of cementite and the water in this bucket is the single crystal of ferrite. So if I put that cabbage in the water, that creates a bicrystal with alternating uh, leaf water, leaf water type of a structure. And when you section that structure, it appears like there are alternating lamellae of cabbage and water, but in fact, this Cementite crystal is connected in three dimensions and so is the ferrite crystal. So you can increase the strength of perlite by decreasing the spacing between the lamellae, but you cannot increase the toughness because the toughness depends on the size of the colony. You can imagine the cementite as being a brittle phase. So essentially this is a single crystal of ferrite okay, with holes in between. So uh, if you have a cleavage crack, it would not be deflected across the colony. And so just refining the interlamellar spacing does not increase the toughness. So our goal is to design rail steels using the carbide-free bainitic steel concept. Now, two of the main requirements for rail steels are rolling contact fatigue and wear resistance. Uh, rolling contact fatigue and wear resistance. And rolling contact fatigue, um, and I don't want you to worry about any detail, is as follows. So if you have a sphere 
in contact with a flat surface here. Uh, and imagine that's a, that's a railway wheel and that's the rail. Then the shear stress that you produce as a result of that contact stress is actually a maximum at a certain depth below the surface, not at the contact zone. Okay? So every time a wheel goes over a rail, it creates a pulse of stress underneath, underneath the surface, uh, and the damage there accumulates, and then you get a fatigue crack growing from there, and you get a spalling of the rail surface. So that's a bad event, right? And the second, uh, uh, second thing we need to worry about is uh, the wear resistance, okay? Uh, so I'm going to show you um, how we do the wear tests. So uh, basically, uh, this is known as a dry rolling sliding wear test where you take your rail material, which is at the bottom here, and then there's a standard material at the top, and you are rotating them at different velocities. So they're basically rubbing against each other. Okay? And there's also, uh, also a load applied from the top, uh, which creates uh, a really severe contact between the two wheels. And the actual uh, sample would look like this. And we have, um, we measure the, where uh, material loss at a variety of stages after stopping the tests intermittently. Okay? That's how we characterize wear in the laboratory. And then you progress to looking at the actual wheels against your rail material in a bigger laboratory, industrial laboratory. So um, in terms of uh, the rolling contact fatigue, the carbide free magnetic ray outperforms anything that exists, okay? Uh, and these are full-scale tests uh, done in industrial laboratories. Uh, more, uh, it outperforms so much that we had to stop these expensive tests. And this is uh, the politic rail and the uh, sort of hardened martensitic rail, uh, only the surface is hardened, okay? Now, these still are not enough to convince uh, people to put trains containing passengers uh, or traffic um, or uh, goods onto real rails. So you have to actually make the rails and then put them onto a test track. And this particular test track is in the US uh, where on this side, we have the politic rail, the head hardened politic rail. And this is um, the new, um, a version of the new carbide free bayonetic rail. And after 90 million gross tons of traffic, you can see the sort of spalling damage on this side, but not on this side. Uh, and that is attributed to the high toughness of this and the fact that we don't have the hard carbide particles, uh, which would induce uh, easier nucleation of cracks. So the carbide free Bainite has no hard particles, only bainitic ferrite <coughs> and retained austenite. Now, if you look at the wear performance, uh, again, it, it, uh, it is better than these uh, rail steels. And furthermore, it reduces, it is the only one that actually reduces the wear rate on the wheel. And you know that in the UK, the track is owned by a different company than the rolling stock. So if you design a rail which uh, will increase the wear rate on the wheel, then you will have some sort of conflict. So anyway, after lots and lots of testing, uh, the rail uh, was installed at various test sites and then also in the channel tunnel. And after many years of service, in, in November 2019, it reached 1 billion gross tons of traffic achieved without any particular problem. And uh, because it is so resistant to rolling contact fatigue, it doesn't get these sort of cracks developing. Uh, and in this case, uh, the, where, where the rails are politic in the channel tunnel, uh, they have to be ground periodically to remove these fatigue cracks. No grinding is necessary in this. And in April 2020, 
I don't have an exact figure, but it exceeded the 1 billion gross tons of traffic on the Benetic Rail. And this was a, a test site in the early days where this is a torpedo car carrying about 300 tons of molten steel traveling on the uh, Benetic, uh, carbide free Benetic Rail. Now, this particular structure of just Benetic ferrite and carbide free uh, retained osnet is very versatile because you can you can get it to be as um, as weak as 1600 megapascals uh, of strength and as strong as two and a half gigapascals of strength by altering the transformation conditions so that you get finer and finer plates you can make it stronger so it's a very versatile microstructure and you can design it for your purpose and if I plot here the fracture toughness versus the ultimate tensile strength, all these dots represent carbide-free bainitic structures. And you can see that uh, they, they are suitable in many applications over a wide range of uh, strength and toughness. Uh, these are quenched and tempered martensitic steels, and these are the so-called uh, maraging steels, which are martensitic but without carbon. Uh, they are hardened by uh, intermetallic compounds such as Ni3MO. Now, uh, we have been working with uh, Swiss steel, uh, and uh, this is the beautiful location where Swiss steel is based. And uh, this is a picture I took once when visiting in winter. You can see these nice coils covered in, in snow. But they have been using uh, our theory uh, to design different applications associated with fasteners and automotive components. So Escometal is a part of, uh, or Swiss Steel and Escometal belong to the same group. And this is a, a fuel injection uh, system that they made from carbide free bayonetic rail and, and so on. So there are airbags, uh, wheelchair, uh, airbag devices and wheelchairs and tool holders all made from the carbide free bainitic steel. And in the cast iron industry, um, they have what they call the os tempered ductile cast iron, where the matrix is no longer perlitic, uh, but contains bainitic ferrite and carbide free retained osmite. And you can make large components by casting, which are actually very tough. You know, so for example, you often think of cast iron because of the presence of these large chunks of graphite as being brittle, but it has 120 joules Sharpie toughness, okay, at a strength level greater than 1100 megapascals. Now, how do we know that retained austenite is playing such a big role? Well, it's very simple to demonstrate that, okay? So we are relying on the retained austenite films to undergo transformation at stress concentrations. Uh, which would lead, which would harden that region locally and therefore delay the onset of plastic instability or fracture because it contributes to strain hardening. The hard martensite hardens that region. Now, if we stopped the austenite from transforming, we should therefore get worse properties. So how do you do that? If you tensile test uh, one of these steels at room temperature, you get a lot of ductility. But if you test it at 200 degrees centigrade where the austenite will not trip, then there's a dramatic decrease in ductility with the onset of plastic instability occurring at a very early stage in the test. So uh, that is the end of the lecture, but notice that the theory on which we base the design uh, is basically what we learned in the third lecture. Okay? So, understanding the atomic mechanisms of the phase transformations. If you go one step further and try to apply them, then you can develop uh, novel concepts. Okay? So it isn't just a question about understanding the mechanism, but you've got to take that next step towards the design uh, of new alloys. So uh, I will stop there and thank you very much.